Hi there. Welcome to another edition of the Kessler Law Firm podcast. I'm your host, Michael Kessler, and joining me this afternoon is my good friend, Cliff Barnes. Cliff, as you might recall, was a longtime criminal defense lawyer in town and spent uh, way too many years as a county court judge here in Fort Pierce. And now he's back in the saddle defending the wrongly accused and sometimes the rightly accused. Cliff is going to help us out today and talk to us about the law of self-defense. Hello, Cliff. Hi, Mike. We're, uh, of course, telling war, war stories. I'm not going to tell all about self-defense. I'm going to tell how you beat a self-defense get or how you win with self-defense in a uh, criminal case. Tell you uh, what, you tell how we win and I'll tell about one we didn't. Oh, Okay. Things can go wrong, as we know. Um, in a self-defense case, it's usually a good policy if you are uh, in a fight or a skirmish that if it's a fist fight, you don't bring a weapon because the law doesn't take kindly on people uh, using um, weapons when there's no reason to use a weapon. So. In one of my cases, my client did just that. He was basically in a fist fight. He pulled out a knife and emptied the attacker's intestines onto the ground in front of him. Um, and he was charged with aggravated battery. And uh, we went to trial, of course. They weren't going to offer anything. And I had a good client, and I had confidence in him. Uh, so we go to trial, and of course, the state uh, makes the argument that just because the um, attacker uh, hit my client with his fist and, you know, cursed him, that my client had no right to immediately pull out a knife and slice him from side to side. Um, it all started at a barbecue, as so many... <laughs> skirmishes in Fort Pierce, Florida do. Good friends, good family. My client uh, was an older gentleman, probably my age that I am now, like a real old guy. And he's assigned the task of cutting up the chicken for the barbecue. So he brings a super sharp knife. He's cutting up the chicken. And somehow, some way, uh, he uh, raised the ire of one of the party goers who physically attacked him, punched him, cursed him. And my guy's response was to do to him what he was doing to the chicken. Um, <laughs> separated. So he, with one swoop of the knife, he cut the man's uh, gut open from side to side. The testimony was that they had to take him to the hospital. And uh, of course, it had to be a pickup truck, right? Uh, so well, he had to pick up the intestines, right? Yeah, he's in the passenger side of the pickup truck, holding his intestines back in his belly. He gets to the hospital. They suture him up. And he was, for all intents and purposes, pretty fine when he came to trial, except that he had this huge scar across his belly. So uh, how do you defend a case where your client uh, takes what appears to be a smaller uh, aggression and turns it into a, a real uh, injurious situation? Prosecutors like to use the word escalate. Escalate with a weapon instead of his fists. Well, as you know, the law doesn't require someone to bring a fist to a fist fight if the other party uh, has way more uh, abilities, is bigger, stronger, younger. And so that's what I focused on in trial. Um, I had the uh, accuser uh, uh, stand in front of the jury. He was a big man. Meanwhile, I dressed my older gentleman in a nice uh, uh, coat and tie, and I made him go out and get glasses so he looked older than he really was. He looked like a professor, peaceful, even though he had a criminal record, peaceful. And 
um, the accused accuser was very happy and you know with my cross examination because I had him stand in front of the jury and flex his muscles, turn around, see his back muscles, uh, describe your height, your weight. Wouldn't you agree you're much bigger, much stronger? What do you do for a living? Oh, I'm a body man in an auto shop. And he was proud of his physique. I remember he that. He was proud of his muscles. The, I had him show the jury his enormous hands that were calloused and scarred from years of working body shop. Um, then I had him, uh, I said, you could, those are strong hands. You could really hurt somebody with those those hands, couldn't you? Oh yeah. Um, and look, show the jury when you ball up your hand into a fist. I said, that's that's a that's a pretty much a dangerous weapon, wouldn't you agree? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> so uh, he was just just so happy to tell the jury how strong and bad he was. And um, I, I, I think I actually had him admit that if he put enough uh, force behind one of those fists that he could kill somebody with one blow. <laughs> so we had more fun on, on cross-examination with him. And uh, meanwhile, the jury's looking over at my professor who's sitting calmly and serenely and has his glasses on and his, what do you call it? A, sport coat had a sport coat on without a tie but he had one of them little ties that cowboys wear a string, string tie string tie and it comes down and he just looked very just not like a angry violent <laughs> man but like a victim and uh so uh i stressed to the jury in, in closing that what we had was a case of justifiable defense that he could have been killed by that big man. Um, and he did not have to wait until he was almost dead to use that knife. He was the, not the aggressor. The other gentleman was the aggressor. He had a right to defend himself with what he had. There was no premeditation in that he went to the truck to get the knife. It was in a, the heat of the moment. So he used, um, what the lawyer would say is he used the amount of force that was necessary to protect himself or defend himself against imminent physical harm. Thank you. And once the man went down, he didn't keep stabbing him. And then one of my uh, things that, you know, had just pops into your head in closing argument is you're standing there all proud of yourself. And, and I said, furthermore, Mr. So-and-so, the accuser, uh, we'll probably go about life bragging about the scar. And by the time it's all said and done, he'll have everyone believing he was in an alligator fight. And he'll wear that scar as a badge of courage his whole life. So it's. And he does. As, and he does, because that's all he got out of his, his uh, confrontation with my client was a scar. And the funny thing in this case was back then we had um, newspaper reporters. We had these things you would open up and there's newspaper local and a reporter followed a lot of the cases and they would ask you at the end of the trial, were you surprised by the verdict? Why do you think the jury did what it did? Because the community is interested in these cases. So uh, the jury was out about a half hour and the reporter asked if I was surprised at the verdict. I said, no, I was only surprised that it took him so long to deliberate. So later that week, we got a phone call from one of the jury persons, a female who told my secretary, I never talked to her, she told my secretary that uh, she had read in the paper that I was surprised by how long they were out. And she just wanted me to know that it only took them five minutes to decide the verdict, but they thought they should at least spend more time in there just to uh, make it look like they weren't rushing things to respect the court and the jury deliberation uh, requirement and all that. So there you go. And I'm excited to hear your story. Well, I, I remember that case. I remember when you tried it because, you know, I tend to look at the entertainment in some of these cases and it was funny to watch 
you cross-examine that guy and have the supposed victim in the case couldn't wait to agree with whatever you were going to ask him next because he was really, really proud. And one of the legal lessons we learned from that is you were able to win that case in part because your client only wounded him once. He didn't continue to stab him. Correct. You and I, a long, long time ago, helped a young public defender prep a case that looked like self-defense, and that was the defense that was going to be used at trial, but it didn't really work out. This was a case involving a shootout at the Sunrise Ford car dealership when it used to be north of town. It was two young punks shooting at each other while they each ducked behind cars. Eventually, the person who became known as the defendant shot and wounded the other guy, and he fell out into the open. And the soon-to-be defendant walked out from behind the car and finished him off with a few more shots. And as we're helping this young public defender prep his case, he had to deal with, why did you keep shooting? Why did the defendant keep shooting? And he got him so he would prep his client that he kept shooting because the wounded man kept going for his gun. When he fell out into the open, the gun fell a few feet away. Why did you keep shooting? He kept moving for his gun. So the case goes to trial and we were in the audience, but too late to help the def public defender or his client. And he gets to that point in the, in the story and the public defender asks his client, well, once he was down and, and dropped the gun, why did you keep shooting? And his client answered, because he kept moving. <laughs> oh my God. Well, it, there you go. It was funny, but we quickly translated. The legal explanation is he continued to use deadly force when it no longer was necessary to defend himself. Can you think of any other examples of self-defense cases you've been involved with? Uh, one of my favorite cases was I was actually in my second uh, term with the public defender's office. I was chief assistant, so I had the responsibility to do uh, most of the first degree murder cases. Um, I had a client in Martin County, and as you probably do, as a lawyer, when I ask for um, advice on a case, I don't ask other lawyers about the facts uh, and what would you do in that case. I ask regular people, friends, family, because uh, I know they're going to give me an honest answer, and then I know they're going to give me an answer based on what they think is fair, which you and I agree is the most important consideration uh, that juries have. They listen to the law, they listen to the argument, but at the root of everything, they want to return a verdict that's fair. Right. So if you can get a jury to believe that the prosecutor is being unfair or that the facts uh, would be unfair to convict your client of this crime, you're way ahead of the game and very rarely will you lose. Well, my case involved a woman, a uh, young woman, probably in her 20s, who had a boyfriend, uh, surprise, right, that there was a fight among lovers. Her boyfriend was probably a little bit older, but about three times her size. Um, they were both, uh, they didn't have a lot of money and they lived in a small apartment and there was a history between them, as you might imagine, where uh, the man who was three times as big uh, had a violent disposition. And my client had been taken to the emergency room and to doctors many times over the course of two or three years that they had their relationship. So uh, my client walks in one evening after working to find her boyfriend working on another girlfriend on the living room couch. Um, she raced to the kitchen. The only um, witness other than my client who could testify 
was the girlfriend who was being worked on by the boyfriend. And she testified that my client ran to the kitchen. She heard uh, the rattle of silverware appliances uh, in the kitchen. She couldn't tell what was going on, but she heard the drawer open and she heard the rattle of, of implements colliding with each other, making a racket. Uh, just about the time my client hit the kitchen, her big boyfriend ran in behind her and then they disappeared out of view of the girlfriend on the couch. And the only person to make it alive out of the bedroom was my client with a knife covered with the decedent's blood, the boyfriend's blood and she threw the knife down and ran, okay? And when the police caught her, um, I believe she told the police, thank God, that uh, he attacked her with the knife and she was able to take it away from him and stab him. Well, the state didn't believe that. How are you gonna take a knife away from this huge, strong man and then stab him without him taking it back or uh, throwing you down and rending you defenseless. Sounds like a fair question. It was, and all my friends told me you're not gonna win the case because this is a clear case of uh, my non-legal friends. This is a clear case of jealousy. She came in, she found her boyfriend cheating on her with another woman right there on the couch in front of her so she ran to the kitchen to get a knife to kill him. Um, and you know, we'll never know because he's dead. And her story was that he attacked her with the knife and she was able by a miracle to get away from him and stabbed him many times and he bled to death on the bedroom floor. Okay, so, uh, I had to fight then the, I guess, quote unquote, common sense that would tell you she'd be an angry, vindictive woman. Um, and I think the history between them, which showed that he had attacked her many a time and, and injured her, uh, not only made the jury uh, maybe put less credence in the jealousy uh, element, but uh, they may have agreed with me when I told them some people deserve to die. I said, he attacked her as he's, as has been the pattern in their relationship. Uh, and she was able to get the knife and he deserved to die because if she wasn't accused here today, he would be on trial here today for killing her. Right. And so, uh, we got a jury verdict of not guilty. And this was a first degree murder with mandatory life in prison. And I was so proud of her. Sometimes we're very, you know, we want our clients to take what we feel is in their best interest, a plea deal. I think they offered her a really generous plea deal if you think it was first degree murder where she would have been out of prison in a couple of years and followed mm -hmm. by probation. And she refused. And uh, she knew better than I did. And um, sounds like justice was done on the case, and he deserved to die. He did die, and she deserved to be acquitted, and she was acquitted. I had a case not as dramatic as that, but similar to that. Um, very early in my career, I had a client that um, had two roommates, two other guys, and one of them was just huge and a bully. And he picked on the other two roommates just mercilessly. And my guy came home one day and the bully was picking on the third roommate. And my client said something to him just in passing and went on into the kitchen. And the bully char charged after him and pushed him from behind, knocking him over into the sink area where there just happened to be a big butcher knife. And my guy picked up the knife and turned around and like the woman said in the movie Chicago, he ran into my knife. <laughs> Only it was just the one time and not 10 times like in the movie. But he ran into the knife 
and bled out. My guy ended up being charged initially with first degree murder. Um, and then when the depositions, including the deposition of the extra roommate, bore out what my guy had told the police happened, just like that, um, a very sensible prosecutor decided not even to take it to a jury trial, no plea offer. He just outright dismissed it. There you go. Justice. Justice was done. And, and unlike your case, my client wasn't forced to choose to risk her life in trial. Yeah, that's a heck of a choice. It, Even it if you have the best case, as you know. And you never know what a jury is going to do. You never do. Right. Let me tell you about another funny one that I did just a couple of years ago when you were busy being a judge. And this was in somebody else's courtroom. I had a client that got in a fight one afternoon on the sunny streets of Fort Pierce. My client and the guy he got in a fight with were both graduates of the Florida Department of Corrections. They'd both been to prison. And they were sort of cousins, but there was something, some bone of contention between them. Well, anyway, at about two o'clock this one sunny afternoon, the two of them are standing about a half a block apart, each of them waiting for a school bus to pick up somebody else's kid to guide them home. And they're talking trash to each other. And at one point, my client, the bigger of the two, kicks off his flip flops and hands his watch and wallet to somebody else at the bus stop, which I guess was his way of saying, let's go. The other guy who was a little bit smaller, but was built like a prize fighter, reaches into his pocket and he pulls out a very sharp knife. And he lets my client see it. And he's basically saying without words, OK, we can fight, but I'm using this. My client charges him and gets stabbed in the belly for his trouble. People break up the fight. The shorter guy gets on his bicycle and rides home. My guy starts walking toward the hospital, holding his belly so his intestines wouldn't fall out. Somebody picked him up, gave him a ride. Saw him bleeding all over the place, takes him to the hospital. The police come to the hospital, interview the wounded man. They go and find the smaller guy on the bike. He still has the knife. He tells him the same story. They charge the guy in the hospital and don't charge the guy with the knife because they decided, well, you started it. It's your fault you got stabbed. And not only that, we're going to charge you with battery for hitting for starting the fight. And because my client had a prior battery among his long list of other priors, it became a felony charge. That sounds fair to me. And a veteran prosecutor who should have known better decided this case needed to go to trial. Um, so we're, we're in trial and I couldn't use self-defense because my client started the fight. And my client didn't escalate it after with the weapon. The other guy did that. My guy never did have a weapon. So I had to, instead of self-defense, I had to call it mutual combat. Two grown men that agreed to fight. Right. So I'm given my opening statement in front of the jury. And I say to the jury, this is two grown men fighting in the streets in broad daylight. This case doesn't belong in criminal court. And I look to my right, sitting in the back row of the courtroom is the supposed victim who stabbed my client and he's nodding in agreement with me. Oh my gosh. I never happen. even cross-examined him. The prosecutor put him on the stand and he's he is telling her, man, he's got problems. I got problems. We're trying to work them out. What are you doing to us? We don't belong here. Oh my goodness. I didn't even have to cross-examine him. And the, the jury stayed out 10 minutes because two people wanted to be four person. Oh they, my came God. In, they came in quickly and did the right thing. So, you know, we look at these cases and we always have to consider self-defense. And sometimes, like in your case, it'll work. And sometimes you've got to come somewhere close. And sometimes self-defense isn't going to work at all. Closer than I shot him because he was still moving. Right. Yeah. And your your guy had the the luck or the smarts not to stab the guy a second time. 
exactly. or a third time or 40 more times. Yeah, exactly. Anyway, thank you all for joining us on another episode of the Kessler Law Firm podcast. Cliff, I appreciate you joining me today and we'll have to do this again. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, that's been the Kessler Law Firm podcast for today. Thank you for joining us. If you'd like to subscribe to this, uh, you can find us on YouTube or probably anywhere else on social media and just hit the subscribe button so you won't miss a single episode. Thanks again.